I think despite the many and varied challenges of the last couple of years, um, there's really a day goes by at the moment when people won't be uh, honestly bombarded probably with the language around climate emergencies, global warming, net zero, future ready. And it's intrinsic in all of the work we do as an industry. So with the dust now settling, I think after the 26th UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, the scale of the challenge and what it means to us as an industry is now starting to come into focus. I think we are probably in a privileged position um, wherever you're joining us from. I don't think you can consider yourself um, a bystander in this experience. And I think rather that we are the policy makers, the planners, the engineers, and unfortunately, it's down to us to come up with a solution to the problem. Um, given this common endeavor, we wanted to share with you really some of the insight and thinking that we've developed as part of our own net zero journey. Um, we are already supporting local and national government in making the right decisions, I think, to realize a net zero future. So on my next slide, um, we have just a summary here of what we've put together as an agenda for you. It's really a bit of a, a trot, honestly, through the, the legislation and guidance at the beginning. This is really just offered at a high level, um, but it might prompt you to go away and do some research, find out some more things about some of the things that we talk about in the presentation. And then my colleague Mark Gree has produced a slightly more detailed um, section for the second half of the presentation. And this is likely to be of interest to you as it does contain some really good examples, I think, of how we've decarbonized some of the schemes that we've recently worked on. So let's just start really briefly then with the context as to why we actually need to manage carbon. We've offered up some definitions on some of the terminology um, if you just flick to the next one for me. So global warming um, is a gradual increase in the overall temperature of the Earth's atmosphere and is generally attributed to the greenhouse effect. This is caused by increased levels of carbon dioxide, CFCs and other pollutants. Probably not news for you there. Climate change, I think we're undeniably experiencing a change in global and regional climate patterns. And in particular, we are noticing an apparent change from the mid to late 20th century onwards. And that's attributed largely to the increased levels of atmospheric CO2 produced by the use of fossil fuels. Alongside other debates, um, discussions, agreements, and, and all of the um, um, the effort that goes on in the political sphere, the Paris Agreement operated by the UN on a five year cycle stated in 2015 that we should aim to limit global temperature increase by one uh, to 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius above pre-industrial levels in order to really put the brakes on that damaging trajectory of climate change. It was actually signed by 192 countries that represented over 95 of the world's global, 95% sorry, of the world's global emitters. Now this event is relevant because it set the legislative framework for much that has followed that point in time. The recognition of the target of 1.5 degrees is discussed commonly in most of the forums that we all attend. And even as recently as Tuesday this week, when Lee Waters um, discussed this at the joint ICE uh, CIHT CILT conference. So we know this is something that affects us and our day to day jobs. In 2019, Chris Gidmore, who was the Minister for, um, of State for uh, university science research and innovation signed a law on behalf of the UK to become the first major economy to commit to 2050 net zero emissions targets but it was Wales's parliament that was actually the first in the world to declare a climate emergency in 2019. So in Wales the chronology of the policy for those of you who aren't aware um, has been that there was a, a carbon budget one which was called prosperity for all um, you you can get still get access to it on the Welsh Government website. That was released in 2019. Um, Carbon Budget 2, which is called Net Zero Wales, was released in 2021. And th so these carbon budgets are, are re-released to align with um, the new budgetary cycles that happen. Carbon Budget 3 will be published from 2026, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, all three have staged reduction targets, which we discuss later. But there are also future years targets up to the net zero target at 2050. 
So at WSP, we had already begun um, to embark on that operational decarbonisation of our services by 2019. Um, we'd been pretty successful in reductions in emissions from things like our offices, um, providing green travel plans for individual staff, our fleet, um, surveying our staff to understand where we should place offices, um, the general use of things like um, paper and printer ink and those sorts of things and how we provide services to staff in our offices and how we travel for business, in particular the use of things like domestic flights. So on the signing of the 2050 agreement, we'd also stated that we would commit to similar reductions and we know that across our in industry, across our community, um, we we have all obviously signed up to similarly very stretching tar targets for carbon reduction. I wanted to pop a slide in here really to try to um, introduce some of the the terminology um, where you may not you know you may not be familiar with it if you have not used um, this in detail. So this is just a bit of a language buster really. Um, so there are five gases or groups of gases that we know co cause global warming. Carbon dioxide is produced when we burn fossil fuels um, through the decaying of uh, waste, through the industrial processes that use natural gas. Um, and CO2 actually makes up 75% of all the greenhouse gas emissions globally. So it is obviously an important one to target. But what I would say is that other greenhouse gases are available and they include methane. Again, comes from fossil fuel use, um, emission from livestock, um, decaying waste, nitrogen oxides. We're familiar with um, NOx and NO2 in Wales. Um, they come from the agricultural sector, emissions from fossil fuels. Um, and anything where there is a, a nitrate based um, release of so again, agriculture is, is a big emitter of nitrogen oxides. And it's also an, an example of a byproduct in the production of chemicals. Uh, fluorinated gases. So there's a range of fluorinated gases and you might have maybe in the past heard them referred to as hydrofluorocarbons. So these are used in refrigerants, aerosol propellants, um, uh, fire retardant materials and things like that. So the gases are actually emitted in the production of them as well as a byproduct from some industrial processes. And then finally, um, water vapour. So water vapour is actually one of the more abundant greenhouse gases. Um, the emission of it, it is not necessarily directly attributed to human activity, but it's increased indirectly by um, you know, by creating a, a warmer atmosphere. So contrails from aeroplanes are a really good example. Um, contrails are sort of frozen trails that form around soot, which is from the exhaust from aeroplanes. It freezes and it essentially creates a, a man-made cloud that is often too thin to reflect sunlight, but ice crystals inside them can trap heat and hence it forms a blanket in the atmosphere. So the relevance of all these different gases is that emissions in terms of global warming and greenhouse gases are actually measured in a standardised unit of CO2 equivalent. You might see it written as um, CO little 2 E um, as a common unit. It's just basically a way of comparing apples with apples across the greenhouse gas world. Um, the quantities of the gases may differ, but actually you can standardise the whole measurement in CO2 equivalent. So when you see uh, that terminology, greenhouse gases or CO2E, they're sometimes used, um, I guess, interchangeably with one another. So this is just um, useful, interesting. I suppose there's probably an awful lot more stuff out there about how you can establish what your carbon impact is from the activities than when we first put this presentation together, which was at the back end of um, last year, really. Um, you can get access to carbon calculators online. Um, a lot of even a lot of banks do them these days. It's worth taking a look to try to understand what impact you have um, on all sorts of things. For example, um, the digitised world, you know, we we 
we promote online working and and all businesses are all businesses are balancing that at the moment but even working digitally and connecting via video conferencing can have a carbon impact so you know you ask yourself how can something invisible like data have a carbon impact but it's actually the way that it's stored that has the impact and the energy needed to produce it so for example um, when we put this presentation together zoom had a higher carbon footprint than other platforms like google um, microsoft have trialed storing their data in the oceans instead of using cooling units um, for data centers and, and they're actually in the sea um, and Microsoft is a key player in carbon capture technologies, and we are not sponsored by Microsoft, but um, this is just to bring these things to your attention. Global wildfires, so obviously the burning of materials releases carbon, and the wildfires between September 2019 and February 2020, so it's just before the pandemic, um, they accounted for double that of the UK's entire annual carbon emissions. All of these references are actually taken from a book called Mike Berners-Lee. Um, the book is called How Bad Are Bananas? And um, although it was published in 2009 originally, it was republished in September 2020. It's definitely worth having a look how to make carbon savvy purchases, choices, things like that. So I would uh, I'd recommend you you take a look at it. So on carbon budgets, <clears throat> it's a very big topic, but I have one slide to offer you um, just as a summary. So we have a carbon budget and unfortunately, presently we are overspending it. Um, the Deputy Minister was quite keen to point this out when we had our joint conference earlier on in the week. And I think it's very significant that transport is the biggest cause. So it's worth a brief reminder really of the scale and urgency of the challenge that we as an industry face. The substantive issue is that we can only permit the emission of a finite amount of greenhouse gases or carbon emissions if we're going to keep global warming to less than two degrees. We should recognise that um, a, a bow wave of carbon, if you like, has already been released into the atmosphere. So that carbon is essentially locked into the system at the moment and that will continue to, to influence climate change. There has historically been a disconnect really between climate change science and decision making in, in infrastructure, but I think we can all be quite um, positive and I think quite proud about the fact that those connections are now quite grounded and quite real and that this, this sort of language is, is falling into everybody's day to day working routine. In the UK and Wales, the limits on carbon emissions have been translated into law as as the carbon budgets. So you can see on the graph there, um, there are there are sort of several uh, carbon budget targets that were set out in each of carbon budget one, two, and and will come in carbon budget three. Um, but the the budgets are hugely ambitious. Mark will talk a little bit later on about how how much and how possible it is to reduce carbon in transport and infrastructure projects in particular. And we are aware as a business, having invested a lot of um, time and people and resource into very large infrastructure projects across the UK, how much energy, effort, expertise and money goes into reducing carbon by a significant amount. So that would probably be more than 40% in a particular de design scenario. So it is a significant mission that we're embarking upon or that we are currently undertaking. Um, I think it's important to see that a change towards technology and zero emission vehicles, for example, advances in material technology. So that could be um, semi-warm or warm pavement mixes, which we heard about this week at the IC conference. Changes in transport needs and modes, how we get around, how much we get around, all of those things will take us in the right direction. But it's important to understand, I think, that the business as usual levels of electrification as forecast in current government data is too slow. So, you know, si simply electrifying our network, um, so that's personal vehicles, um, and trains and an amount of heavy goods, it, it will be insufficient on its own 
to take us to the net zero target at 2050. The other thing to consider is the lag between policy and reality. So um, the ban on the sale of new petrol and de diesel vehicles means that you know you won't be able to purchase one beyond 2030. But in reality, people will probably own a petrol or diesel vehicle for a significant number of years beyond that. And then at a strategic level, we need to think, I suppose, about the more ambitious action that we need to take. And we talk a little bit about that um, later on. And, and that's more to do with planning and understanding the answers to transportation problems in a slightly different way to perhaps that we have done in the past. I think importantly and positively, it's important to, to see and recognise that reduction is happening and it is possible. And the changes are affected by me, by you, and by all of the things that we do when we come to work every day. Um, there isn't necessarily a set out, defined way of doing this yet. We're making that now. So you, you all and I have a part to play in that journey. Um, the other thing to consider as well is that we're not talking about no carbon, not yet at least. We are trying to keep the water level in the bathtub. So we are we are having to implement strategies to essentially make sure that the in and the out balance so that the level stays at a net zero level. So if we can go on to just really quickly talk about PAS 2080. Um, PAS 2080 was launched in 2016 and it's a global standard for managing infrastructure carbon. Um, it's applicable to any member involved in the delivery of infrastructure, including asset owners, managers, designers, constructors, and, and hence that is why it is relevant to us all. So the PAS is only concerned with greenhouse gas emissions or carbon associated with infrastructure. So that's defined really as transport, energy, waste and um, communications. So it doesn't actually cover buildings. Its scope is primarily concerned with capital carbon and operational carbon and to a lesser extent user carbon. So capital carbon is the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the creation, the refurbishment and end of life treatment of an asset. So, for example, embodied carbon within construction materials for a motorway. Operational carbon, so that's the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the operation of infrastructure. So that could be the energy used to power street lighting. The user carbon is the greenhouse gas, em gas emissions associated with user um, utilisation or uptake of an asset or piece of infrastructure, but during operation, but only the yeah, only the user emissions. So and, and those are the things that you as a, an asset owner or manager can actually influence. So there are some other key concepts as part of PAS 2080. Um, early engagement is quite a key one. And I've heard a lot about this over the course of the last week. The earlier that carbon is considered in an asset's life cycle, the greater the scope for actually managing and reducing it. So the later we leave it, the greater the number of opportunities for reduction that will have been lost. So early involvement might possibly be one of the most important concepts in the PAS, because there seems very little point in managing or um, measuring carbon after you've already finished making all your decisions. So I think it's quite important to remember that. Uh, roles and responsibilities, so to ensure the greatest reductions in carbon and inspire the most innovative low carbon solutions, it's important that all four roles within the value chain work collaboratively with one another. There's obviously lots of that that goes on already, so I think it's just a case of stitching this concept into those conversations, those documents, the reports and the methods that we already use to collaborate. It's not always that straightforward because obviously there is a push pull in this environment when it comes to deciding whether to spend more now in order to reduce carbon later on, for, for instance. Um, but it is something that the PAS requires us to do. Um, whole life carbon. So this is the total carbon or the sum, the sum across all the life cycle stages of an asset that should be assessed and reduced. Um, 
This is really to avoid making a carbon reduction in one life cycle stage that sets the thing on fire further down the road. So, for example, um, using a material that is very low carbon initially, but then when you get further down the line, you end up having to relay a material 20 times more than you would have done before because it, it wasn't appropriate for use. So there's a lot of technology, a lot of technological advance that's needed perhaps some um, alignment between how we specify materials and what materials we're prepared to accept. Um, that's a very big piece of work. That's a very big body of work. And, and there's there's lots of things being done in that space already. Um, the next one is governance, uh, sorry, the hierarchy. So the hierarchy concept, it speaks for itself really. And I think if you were to um, look at things like the Wales Transport Strategy and similar other Welsh Government documentation, which frames the policy for th these themes, the build nothing, build less, build clever, build efficient is the carbon hierarchy. So that do, do you need to build it at all is the first question. And this is where that consideration to how we address transportation problems is something that we um, we need to think probably a little differently about um, what is the solution if it isn't building something. But similarly, um, I think there's a there's a lot of discussion really around uh, the, the what we've just been talking about there with changes in materials, about building clever, building efficiently, reusing assets, all the sorts of things that feature quite strongly in asset management and maintaining a, a large network. And then the final part of this is governance. So having effective carbon management systems and processes embedded into scheme development and delivery is emerging as quite a key, key concept across the UK. So, for example, for a lot of the, the projects that we've worked on that involve the DFT, um, we, we have recent published guidance that focuses on the scope of carbon management plans. We are writing carbon management plans for clients, which is um, obviously really reassuring. And we're doing that at very early stages in the schemes. So in Wales, the equivalent to this might be things like compliance with Future Generations Act and the WellTag processes, but at the, the sort of pre-WellTag 1 stages. Um, so I think conceptually, th this is where the, the early engagement of um, desire, uh, designers, end users, builders, it all needs to fit together to generate a carbon management plan that achieves the best balance across the project, but the best carbon output um, that can possibly be achieved. So it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of PAS 2080. Um, but now I'm going to pass you over to Mark because he's going to pick up the, the clever stuff, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I just check that you can hear me uh, to change my headset um, whilst Kate was speaking? <laughs> That's good. Thanks, Kate. So when we talk about the management of carbon, um, the measurement piece is, is one of the most important steps. So in the words of Lord Kelvin, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we need to be able to measure carbon if we are to make an informed choice for its reduction. So measurement at its core is quite a fairly simple concept, really, um, in that greenhouse gas gas emissions are measured in tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, as Kay explained earlier, um, and that's estimated by multiplying the activity data. So, for example, an amount of steel in tonnes by an emission factor. So that might be the amount of greenhouse gas emitted per, per tonne of that steel. Um, however, in practice, it can be quite difficult in obtaining reliable figures for both, both metrics, so both the amount and the emission factor. Uh, firstly, if we take the amount, so on most schemes, this is defined through a bill of quantities, um, but the standard method of measurement doesn't usually translate to a tonne or volume of material. So, for example, if we were to equate that to uh, a pipe, so the standard method of measurement um, equates that to a pollinia meter of installation. But then if we break that down to a quantity of material, so we've got the pipe and then we're looking at the pipes around, plus the effort of getting that all constructed and in the ground, it doesn't really relate to the standard method of measurement. So it involves an interim calculation step to, to translate. Um, and using a bill, of course, is only suitable if that bill is ready at the right time uh, in design to be able to influence change. And it often isn't in, in a project. It often comes much later in the process. Um, so the number of challenges to, to sort of 
uh, estimating the amount of material within our designs. Um, moving on to the emissions factor, because this isn't that straightforward either. Um, there are many um, databases out there that contain information, but they conflict with, with one another. They, they often measure different parameters. Um, there's different conflicting sources as well. And, and all that, if you consider in a market where products um, and suppliers are sort of um, continually applying pressure to each other, there's a lot of competition there. So um, they report their figures slightly differently. So it's, it's really difficult to establish that level playing field across, the, um, across that set of data as well. Um, so WSP have, are in the process um, and have developed some various tools um, to capture the carbon and, and measure it. And we're also working with third party suppliers for measuring carbon data as well. Um, so what, what we've done for our internal baselining, we've used one click LCA. Um, and we can talk about that um, when I showcase some of the case studies a little bit later on, primarily our own highways internal baselining. So WSP's approach to reducing carbon, um, this is quite multifaceted. Uh, initially, we, we think that true value should be placed upon a line in the carbon budgets that Kate explained earlier on and the various climate change pledges that um, made by our clients um, back to the strategic transport plans. So as we saw earlier, many of our clients have, have actually declared various climate change pledges, um, but many don't understand how this actually links to, to carbon management and reduction on any given scheme. Um, so our transport planning team have developed the Carbon Zero um, appraisal tool. And the aim of this really is to give the strategic decision makers a, a tool um, to make an informed decision to, to, to showcase whether or not that specific project aligns with their net zero pledges. Um, I'm going to showcase a couple of examples a bit later on, but firstly, I'm just going to give an, an overview of its capabilities. Um, firstly, to make that informed decision, we need to understand that the true transport's contribution is a whole life impact. That means understanding both the user emissions as well as the embodied carbon in construction and its operational maintenance. Um, without looking at the user emissions, we might be able to minimise the impacts um, during construction and operation by building efficiently and building with better materials. But we wouldn't be able to maximise the impacts such as modal shifts. And it's those impacts that are a direct um, product of the decisions that are made at the various earliest stages of the project. So as Kate explained earlier, getting in there early is, is of vital importance. Um, so the carbon tool can help us to understand and analyze this, look at the timings of it, um, and make sure that the, the scheme selected um, fits within our policy. Um, and also it can showcase how we can actually take that through design, set out some steps. Um, to outline um, how we can reduce it in design uh, as well and how we can actually later construct it. So a key point of this is that timing matters. We need to act quickly now, um, in fact, to be, to be able to deliver the right infrastructure. So as we noted in the budgets earlier, we, we are overspending at the minute and we only have a finite amount of carbon left to emit before our bathtub fills up and flows over. Um, and if we are slow to act, we're just going to exhaust all our carbon too soon, um, as early as this decade, in fact. Um, so the investment decisions we make now should should therefore be informed by that urgency to act, as well as an awareness of, of the decisions that we're making and the impact that they're going to have. So we know the fleet's going to decarbonise, but in the 2020s, the vast majority of that fleet is powered by fossil fuels. And so is the energy grid that's used to provide the power for electric vehicles. So avoiding a trip in the 2020s has so much more value than avoiding one in the 2040s. So therefore we can get, get better carbon savings when they're needed the most. Um, there are also co-benefits of, of, of shifting car use right now though. Um, so we see improvements in noise, in air quality, and, and they can also help to free up space um, in our cities so they can be better used for people in, instead of cars. So this does make the 2020s a really uh, a sweet spot for, for interventions that avoid or shift trips. And it does give the decision makers, it provides them with a compelling case for taking bold action to, to deliver the transport system that many of us want to see. It's, it's a really good opportunity for us to sort of think differently and put, and put a different solution in place that avoids car trips. Um, but building things as well, we must also be mindful of the construction impact that we have during the 2020s, while our manufacturing and transport that's used to move things and build things is still really carbon intensive, meaning that right now we would need to intensively manage the carbon in design um, 
So therefore, the best scheme right now would be the one that reduces car use with little or no construction. So things like road space reallocation, for example. Um, and then road building and um, you know, you know, schemes to increase capacity would probably be much more carbon viable in the future when the fleet and construction are mostly decarbonized. Um, but at that point in time, what we do have to understand is that carbon budgets will leave us with very little um, carbon to emit. So low carbon construction and probably offsetting um, will be of vital importance. Um, we do we do recognize this is quite a challenge. It, it's pretty big, um, especially when you balance that with the urgent need for, for things like housing growth that road building has traditionally supported. Um, but following what we know about climate change, where we're going with it, um, spatial planning must adopt that modal hierarchy that prioritizes shifts away from cars and prioritizes those developments that aren't car dependent. Um, so hopefully that sets out a little bit of um, background about how we can offer uh, some evidence to support the strategic case. Um, and if we're confident that we're making the right decisions and picking, picking the right schemes to move forward, um, we still do have to manage that carbon in design appropriately. Um, and to do that, we need a baseline carbon footprint. So it's the responsibility of the asset owner or manager to set carbon reduction targets, which the other value chain members must then in turn adopt. Target reductions have to be made relative to a baseline. Now, the baseline is the hypothetical scenario for what emissions would have been in the absence of any planned measures to reduce emissions. So how do we go about setting targets? Well, we believe the best way to make that informed decision is by first undertaking an assessment of the baseline by identifying the hotspots within our design. So our software provider, who I mentioned earlier on, One Click LCA, um, had developed lots of easily available dashboards um, that help us with that data so that we can um, drill down and use graphics to help us in that process to sort of um, look at areas or disciplines or specific life cycle stages that are the most carbon intensive. We can then use our knowledge and experience to advise on the appropriate level of reduction or our carbon reduction target. What we're then left with is our smart reduced carbon design. Now, of course, in practice, it's never really that, that simple. And during design and at the different stages of, of the project lifecycle, we constantly have to be challenging this. We have to remeasure, rebaseline, and reassess to keep on track. And each one of these assessments, we're constantly challenging the target by ap applying those principles of, of um, carbon reduction that Kate mentioned earlier on. Um, so it's really important that when applying the targets and baselines as well that we're assessing against the same client scope and requirements. Otherwise, we can just run the risk of comparing um, a different scheme. So we might be making reductions that that we just don't know. We can't compare whether that that meets the the, tar the initial targets that we set. Um, and every time that changes again, we have to rebaseline and retarget from that change scope. So I'm going to move on to um, our um, and our future ready pledges really. So we've already explained that we've made the industry pledge to um, half the carbon footprint in our design and advice by 2030. But, but really the net zero pledge is just part of our wider future ready strategy. Um, and it's something that at WSP we're, we're quite proud of. We see it as a differentiator for us. Um, so the, the global challenge is, is quite simple really. Um, our des designs and advice have a long life. So sometimes up to 120 years for infrastructure or, or definitely certain elements of that infrastructure um, and in this time the future will be very different um, we're also faced with the fact that design codes and standards are slow moving so design to standard is sometimes not sufficient to meet the goals of a changing future so wsp's response to this is is future ready um, it's our global innovation program it's not just a uk wide thing it's, it sets us um, on our global strategy it's embedded well within that um, and it allows us to see the future more clearly or empowers us to think about the future and how that resonates with what we're trying to do um, and the advice we're giving to our clients. Um, and it really gives us the power to think of it on, on every single project. Um, so by truly understanding the trends that Im impact our economy and the environment and our society, we, we feel that we can develop solutions to meet our clients' interests, future-proof the work we do and positively impact um, the communities that that we that we live and work in. Um, 
we're quite proud of the fact that we, we challenge the status quo, challenge those designs and, and, and existing thinking, and we can help societies modernise, excel and thrive sustainably within that. It, it does genuinely give our staff a huge purpose in our role and allows us to shape strong lasting legacies for, for the future generations. So we've got a few case studies and examples that we'd like to share with you uh, today to demonstrate the things that we've been talking about. Um, we'll start with the Glen Conway interchange. Um, we're going to move on to our work in developing the National Highways Net Zero strategy. Um, I'll then outline a couple of examples of the Carbon Zero appraisal tool that I touched on earlier on. Um, and all that before, we're going to go then delve into our own baselining exercise, specifically to talk about some of the few interesting things that we learned during that exercise. Um, and then finally, um, we'll talk about the Curzon Street station for HS2, and that contained a really ambitious target to reduce reduce carbon. Um, but firstly, starting with the Glen Conway interchange. Um, so here, our future ready program identified five future trends. Under the climate trend, we replaced lost trees with a light for light replacement. And we also introduced wildflower mixes to increase di biodiversity on the scheme. So there was a biodiverse net gain on this scheme. Under the technology trend, we specified low energy lighting um, and also introduced signals to improve the operational efficiency of the junction. Under the net zero trend, uh, we used a carbon footprint calculator to determine the embodied carbon of the scheme. Under the resources trend, we looked at uh, asset renewals within the scheme to reduce those uh, the need for future site visits. Local suppliers were also um, used predominantly during construction, so that was thought about during the specification of our, our design. And then under the society trend, uh, we encouraged modal shift from car journeys to walking and cycling via active travel provision. Um, and this is the one that we're, that we're most proud of really uh, in this scheme. And it actually resulted, so we measured the, um, the trips before and after the scheme. And um, what we found is um, we observed an active travel number increase by 67%. So it was a real, real success for us here. Um, the result of all those, those modal shifts was a predicted saving of 479 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Um, and again, that was assessed by looking at the embodied construction impact, which was then offset by the user emissions gained through a 60 year appraisal period within that modal shift. Our next project in the spotlight is the National Hero, uh, National Heroes, National Highways Net Zero Strategy. Um, this this one was a major piece of work with us. It, it had future trends at its heart. Um, we we actually demonstrated future ready at the bid stage on this, and by doing so, we were able to convince the client that our solution and market leading expertise were best place to advise. We brought together a team, a uh, collaborative team across WSP, and that was supported by our framework partners, so KPMG, Mott McDonald and Ramble. We listened, collaborated and engaged deeply across national highways, drawing from, you know, all the way up to the board and executive committee down to the, the practitioners who would lead um, and implement the, the plan and run the schemes on the ground. Um, and we feel that this collaborative approach helped create a plan which is both ambitious and deliverable. Um, and which positions the strategic road network in the in England at the heart of delivering net zero. And to do this, we uncovered three future trends. The first is the technology trend. So we know innovations and price drops will will drive rapid uh, electric vehicle fleet growth, and that's across all forms of transport as well. Um, within the net zero trend, and again underpinned by the Paris Agreement, the UK le legislation will provide the catalyst for change. And then the resources trend, where we know the energy grid will decarbonise and the largest contributor of the road materials in terms of construction um, and replacement during their service lifetime, um, concrete and asphalt, uh, the, the biggest two there, uh, they'll follow suit, they will decarbonise over the lifetime of schemes. So by showing how the future will innovate fast, we gave the board and the executive committee the confidence to sign up to one of the most ambitious net zero strategies in UK infrastructure today. Uh, the outcome was the 2030, 2040, 2050 plan. It contained three strong commitments um, and these were backed up for opportunities for both immediate and sustained action. Um, so this includes firstly in, in a nutshell, um, deliver in its own operational emissions by 2030. So that's really the energy used to light and power the national highways network and um, travel by their traffic officers and the energy used in their offices and other travel uh, it also includes carbon locked up in trees and plants um, along the motorway verges 
Uh, secondly, deliver net zero maintenance and construction by 2040. So this is quite a big one as well. Um, the target covers the greenhouse gases emitted in all the uh, making materials, all the products, getting them to the site, both uh, in construction and replacement of, of their assets and the operational maintenance. Um, thirdly, and lastly, um, deliver net zero carbon travel on their roads by 2050. Um, the largest source of emissions comes from the vehicles driving on their road network, um, and this is, this is a really ambitious target. They're not alone in it, but it's going to require some pretty um, intensive intermediate targets. So firstly, a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030 and a 90% reduction by 2040. Um, national highways are going to enable that by investing in the infrastructure now. Um, primarily, that, that's looking at things like providing enough charging points um, to keep the network charged and operational during that transition. Um, so through the plan, national highways are now able to, to demonstrate that strong leadership, um, but it's backed up by that science based robust and, and it's a visionary strategy as well. Um, they demonstrated what can be achieved in setting an infrastructure um, strategy on what's the biggest um, infrastructure network in the UK. So next I'm going to look at some examples of the carbon zero appraisal framework and this this really sets out the um, I suppose the case for for making sure and, and demonstrating that the schemes that we're we're providing do meet our our climate change pledges. Um, I'm going to start with a, a cycle, a cycle scheme. So I think um, on this one, really we are expecting the a cycle scheme to to provide a positive impact on society and I have a good net zero solution, but we do still have to demonstrate that. We do still have to show how it supports a modal shift from car to cycling. Um, and the, the carbon zero tool really helps us out with that. So embodied carbon can, because it, sometimes it's not always as um, straightforward as, as it might seem as well. So um, to take this, to this scheme here, so particularly from a segregated cycle lane um, with plenty of new surfacing and concrete for curbs can uh, have quite a big, big construction impact. So that that kind of offsets the the, the net gain that you, you make from all those modal shifts. Um, and we need to actually drill down into the specific figures to see um, what what impact that has. Um, you would probably think in a cycle scheme though that overall over its appraisal lifetime, it has a net carbon benefit. Um, so one that reduces uh, emissions as opposed to sort of the traditional um, scheme. But with that offset that we're talking about from the construction and the user emissions, there is generally a payback period. In this example that we're showing here, it's um, it's actually over 10 years. Um, now, this may raise into question whether it's an over-engineered solution. Um, a different design philosophy might be needed here. So can the payback be reduced by choosing a solution that requires less materials? Um, for example, then we're talking about that reallocation of road space again instead of widening the highway and, um, and providing all new surfacing and concrete curbs. Um, we've actually appraised quite a number of schemes similar to this over the course of the last year and found that many of them, they're not, um, well, they perform poorly um, in terms of the whole life carbon assessment. So it's something that we might um, we might need to look at a little bit more clearly. It's, it's not something on face value that we can take as a given. So like this example, there might be a long payback period or there might even be a net disbenefit when traffic consequences of prioritising active and shared modes have additional impacts um, on carbon, such as rerouting or congestion of vehicles. Um, and these might, weigh, might outweigh some of the savings from modal shift. So it's really important that we can recognise that the quantified carbon appraisals of a single scheme don't always tell us the full story we need. Um, we must also explore the in combination benefits. Um, so we tend to appraise schemes in isolation, but the reality is that the mode shift is influenced by the wider transport system. So, for example, if the scheme is part of a, a wider program of cycling upgrades, the total mode shift of all those schemes put together is likely to be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, also, future scenarios as well. Um, so bringing, bringing our future ready thinking back into it. Um, so our appraisals forecast impacts out to the future where there's significant uncertainty in how we travel or how we're going to travel in the future. So scenario testing is quite important when we're looking at that, um, particularly to test whether schemes are compatible to the conditions in a low carbon future. So if, for example, if demand for cycling is much, much higher in future than we think it is right now, 
the introduction of this scheme could enable and support a much greater level of modal shift than under demand today. So we just need to test those those hypothetical situations just to, to test our current thinking and make sure that our our schemes are, are resilient and, are, and robust to a different future. Um, but these these factors don't dismiss the value of a quantified uh, scheme level appraisal. That's still important. It still needs to be done, but it's I suppose just recognition that um, the carbon lens from the decision making perspective at least um, must take a wider view than just the embodied numbers on a, on a single scheme. Um, and it's that philosophy really that's I suppose um, driven the evolution of our carbon appraisal tool. Uh, the next example again, uh, carbon zero appraisal tool uh, example is from a junction improvement scheme. So on this one, user emissions, uh, we may realise some carbon savings actually from traffic efficiencies, such as reduced journey times or reduction in stop start traffic. But movements for but improvements for private car users are likely to have an induced demand, which increases car use. Um, so embodied emissions are typ typically significant for this scheme. Um, so you embed the the construction operational impact as well as the uh, additions from the from the use. Um, you're probably going to have quite a significant carbon impact. Um, we might get some tree loss, but mitigate this through tree planting as well. But overall, you would probably oops, sorry I clicked on a bit earlier that. But overall, you would probably see um, a scheme like this over its appraisal period to, to have an adverse impact, so increased carbon emissions. Um, but the timing, as I said earlier, the timing of this is, is quite important. So if we look at the graph in a little bit more detail, um, and this is cumulative emissions here, the construction embodied impact all occurs at the beginning of the project, and this is at the time when we urgently need to reduce emissions. So in, escape, in the case of a scheme like this, by understanding that, um, we can hopefully help to steer the decision, the early deci decision making process. So, and we have to ask ourselves, if this scheme is making car use more attractive and it has a significant carbon impact, is it actually compatible with our decarbonisation commitments or should it be delayed until the construction processes and road vehicles are decarbonised? Um, we should also you know, test it for future ready scenarios. Um, question whether additional road capacity is needed in a low carbon future, one, one where we wish to reduce car use. Um, and is it therefore robust to that different future? So we're kind of resonating with calls to move away from a predict and provide approach to transport planning, whereby traffic growth is catered for with road capacity towards one where it's a decide and provide approach. So one where we design a transport network ready for the changes that we want to see happen. But that does take bold action from those decision makers and, and hopefully with the tools that we've developed, we can give you that ammunition that you need to be able to demonstrate that. So moving on to our next uh, case study, and this is our own uh, WSP Highways um, carbon baseline. Um, so in order to support our pledge to half a carbon footprint in our designs and advice by 2030, we of course need to establish our own baseline. Um, so we set about measuring that um, within our own projects. So we took we took a sample of projects throughout the UK and devolved nations um, and calculated their embodied carbon. Um, we found out some pretty interesting things with it actually. So I'm going to share some of those things uh, within four metrics that we that we looked at. So the first metric is carbon as a function of million pounds of construction cost. Um, we looked at carbon as a function of infrastructure per linear meter. We looked at carbon as a function of life cycle stage and also carbon as a function of activity or item. So within the carbon as a function of million pound construction cost, we saw that the active travel schemes have much less carbon per uh, million pound than other categories such as the larger you know, dueling schemes, the larger junction improvements. Um, that's not not anything groundbreaking really it sort of follows logic convention um but in delving the date in, into the data and understanding this and analyzing that we we sort of saw that actually you know the real value comes from the ownership and application of all this data so by collating that all we'd be able to advise the client early on um in the design stage in terms of what to expect for a carbon budget um as opposed to their monetary budget so we'd be able to link that up so they can make earlier decisions um, so we therefore saw it as being pretty useful in our future metric, in our future ready and net zero metrics. Um, and so much so that we are actually actively taking that forward now using the data we've gained to develop our own internal tools that seek to align carbon and cost. Um, 
we think that efficiencies in calculations can be made with that as well and we can better inform clients at that earlier stage so that's um that's a really exciting project for us um as well so the next metric um this again we we see this has been really useful specifically um at those early stages of the project um and it's carbon per infrastructure of uh linear meter so we're looking at breaking down carbon numbers per meter of a cycle lane or um, a new a dueling scheme, for example. Um, we see that really being valued because at those early stages, you, you really don't know much about the scheme other than perhaps a line on a plan, um, how long it's going to be. So if we can we can um, link that up to the carbon data um, and sort of say with our historic data, OK, if you're looking at a scheme of this length, you're probably looking at this much carbon. We can use that to really quickly um, assess different options of schemes at that early stage to to drive in, you know, building those carbon numbers to help drive that early decision making. Um, as well, what we're looking at is developing a little bit more maturity into our initial data. So we, we really sort of broke that down as a literal, um, so carbon per linear meter of scheme. What we're now doing is um, is breaking that down to its constituent parts. So we might take um, a bridge out of that. We might take a specific type of junction out of that, and we're separating the data that we get from our carbon in these schemes, so that at those early stages of the projects, we can build those features in at a click of a button. So we've got a line on the plan. We know it might then contain two bridges. We can build the data from those two bridges using the type of form um, of construction that they're likely to have into our early scheme appraisals, um, because that's going to vary uh, on a line of plan. You're probably going to know that information from quite an early stage. And if we can just add those as bolts on, it just get, gives that different level of understanding into those early stage assessments. So that's something that we're we're currently actively working on um, and we hope to be able to sort of really build that into our, our early designs on projects and those early early decisions. The next metric is the carbon of a function of life cycle stage. Um, this one surprised us a little bit. Um, so whilst the construction stage, which in this case is the product transport and construction process, whilst that element is big, um, the largest contributor that we found is the replacement and refurbishment stage. Um, it's a little bit different to what we expected, I think. Um, it's, it's the section shown in yellow here. Um, we delved into this to try and understand why that is, um, and, and we saw it's largely explained by analysis of the next metric. And this one is carbon as a function of activity or item. So it shows that pavement is the main driver behind this. Um, it also shows that transport infrastructure in particular is quite unique in this aspect um, and it's caused by the fact that some of the design life of, of elements like the pavements are low they can be as little sometimes as 20 years um, when compared with the design life of the asset again that can be up to 120 years um, so often meaning that that, that has to be replaced five or six times um, during its lifetime um, so once we delved into that um, when we understood why I think we got a, a, a real understanding of that um, and it really helped us to sort of focus our efforts in in, tra in training and design um, decisions in reduction incentives within the business so that we can concentrate and really pinpoint our efforts into key areas. Our next project in the spotlight is uh, HS2. So WSP has a major role in HS2, including the design of some of the new stations. Um, this one is Curzon Street Station in Birmingham. It's, it's quite a big piece of infrastructure. Um, and one of its most significant impacts on this one is its um, uh, impact during the construction stage, so the embedded carbon within its construction and on operational maintenance. So since February 2018, WSP's carbon experts have worked in close conjunction with HS2 and the Birmingham Curzon Street designers themselves. Um, and that really at the early stages was to agree a clear and justifiable baseline for the scheme. Um, and then that, that's then used to make the savings. So that early collaboration resulted in, I, I suppose it's fair to say, quite ambitious target um, to reduce the carbon by 50% against the baseline. Um, the strategies that that were developed on this one include uh, the use of prefabricated beams rather than in situ pour. The replacement of an aluminium roof with uh, with timber, the use of recycled sub base material, um, the reuse of renewable energy during that construction stage, and also the specification of, of low carbon concrete. To date, the hard work of the team has achieved a 43% reduction 
Um, so not quite there yet, but I think there's, there's still a few uh, opportunities to make that change. Um, but even with that 43% reduction, um, that equates to more than 60,000 tonnes of CO2. E. Um, that does actually equate also to uh, nearly 185,000 flights um, from London to Hong Kong, um, over 7,500 car journeys, and that's around the world. So pretty big car journeys um, and 0.9 billion cups of tea as well. So the savings we're talking about are pretty big here, and I hope that demonstrates the impact that we can have in, in sort of schemes in reducing the carbon. Um, I mean, we do realise that 50% reduction is is pretty tough, especially right now, um, and probably does need the full weight of a scheme like HS2 to achieve. Um, but I suppose I, I think it demonstrates that while doing those big projects at WSP, we can then share this knowledge with a, a wide range of people that we have, and they work on a wide range of schemes, um, both big and small. Um, and then we can all learn from the things and the processes and the practices that have been used on that bigger project and then disseminate that down to the smaller schemes. Um, and, and really you know, bring those things through that's made that such a success in terms of climate change management. So that brings us to the end of, of really what we're going to share today with you. Um, I hope it's been really useful to you um, and that it's helped to inspire you, I think, um, to see that whilst the problem is big, we as transport planners, engineers, decision makers, we are really uniquely placed in order to be able to influence the outcome here. Um, at WSP, we've developed some really good tools um, to be able to help you. Um, and with our, our knowledge that we've gained over the last sort of few years intensively managing this, we're able to, to advise you on the best solutions. Um, but to make the change needed, we have to collaboratively act and act now. We saw earlier that, there's, that there really is no time to delay on this, but we can all play our part. So if, if one thing that you take away from this is, you know, make this personal, find out what, what carbon means on your projects. Be inquisitive, you know, ask the questions, understand what changes you can make, challenge those that say, no, we can't do that. Change the approach. Because if everybody did this, I'm really confident that together we can we can solve what will probably be one of the most ch biggest challenges ever to face our society. So yeah, I'm gonna leave you on that really. Um, so I hope you enjoyed. I want to just get your thoughts on um, what else you might want to see from us from WSP with regard to training or knowledge sharing. Um, I'm aware that many topics here we've only lightly touched upon and um, we've, we've really just skimmed the surface. So we'd be more than happy to share similar training with you, maybe go into a bit more depth in some areas or, or just, you know, provide more of the same. Um, just please, if, you, if you've got any thoughts on that, just type something in the chat box. Um, and I think Alice is going to collate any requests on that for, for you. So I know this might be, you know, a bit more training on carbon literacy to help you bust that jargon, to help you understand what it means and, and I suppose make it more relevant to, to you and the things that you do in your day to day activities. Um, we can go into a bit more detail with carbon modelling and measurement if you like. Um, we can even explore behavioural change because it's going to be needed quite a bit in this topic really. Um, so that might be implementing some speed limit changes. So I'm aware there's a drive at the moment to um, extensively change the speed limits on, on a lot of the of the network in Wales down to 20, mile per hour, 20 miles per hour. It's not really going to be that practically enforceable. It's going to need quite a significant behavioural change to implement that. Um, so we can provide you with some training on, on how to influence that, um, how to influence modal shift. People are going to need to use different forms of transport. We're not going to get there by electrifying our network, by choosing smarter materials. It's going to take a modal shift and that's a big, big part of it. Um, so we can help you with the behavioural change with that. Um, or just you know general attitudes to climate change because they're, they're still out there. A lot of people still don't see this as important or, or I suppose relevant to them um, to understand you know why do I need to make this change. Um, we can help with carbon management for project managers and designers as well so if you've got any thoughts on that just, just let us know um, and a bit more about our future ready program so if you're looking at a framework or a methodology or you know, any evidence that you can provide on your schemes to, to demonstrate how um, we've considered uh, future generations within our designs, then um, yeah, just just pop something in the chat and we'll um, we'll see if we can help out.